Welcome to Veterans of the Valley. I'm Tom Turpeville. Carl Huss joined the Army Air Corps before U.S. involvement in World War II started with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. He was just looking to learn a trade, and indeed he did, as a radio man, stationed first for nearly three years in Alaska, then in the Philippines near war's end. He became pretty well versed in American-Russian relations during the war, and that's just a part of a fascinating story of service. Please welcome, if you will, Carl Huss to Veterans of the Valley. Carl, it's a pleasure to have you here. I, I just, I, I love your story of service uh, in, the, in World War II, even though it didn't necessarily involve any combat, it was still a very interesting story. Thank you you. As, a, as, as a radio man, let's start. You, you grew up in Oklahoma in the Depression. Uh, you wanted a career job. Right after you graduated from high school, you were in the Army in 1940, right? Right. Yeah, talk about that. Well, Lord, I came to a little old town in, in uh, Oklahoma, depression, no jobs. I'm going into the service and getting me a career. Right. Learn photography and come out and, you know, make a lot of money. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Didn't work out that way. No. So it, I joined the Air Corps, hitchhiked from Oklahoma up to Illinois and joined the Air Corps there in Illinois. And I sat there and did KP. I signed up for photography. And I waited and waited in KP and KP. Finally, I said, hey, what else have you got? They said radio, so I went to radio school down at Scott Field, which is south, of, uh, down south in Illinois. Right, right, uh, right. <clears throat> several months of that, put up the board, where are you going? Elmendorf Field. Anchors, Alaska. Where in the world is that? <laughs> I soon learned. <clears throat> so I got up there in October of '41, of course, before Pearl Harbor. Right. And uh, I want I want to stop you there because you talked about you know how you had grown up and sort of the difference a little bit when you went into the service. Um, Carl is a writer, and we're going to talk about that a lot more because his 30-year career was in journalism, as a matter of fact. And he's written a uh, he's written a book here. If we could, uh, this is a, a lot of book about. This is actually a collection of his writings. It just goes on and on and on. And I want to read just real quick from this because you this sort of refers to when you went from your your normal life when you were in high school into uh, the service. And he writes in poem. As a matter of fact, he says, "My first meal in this uh, mess hall nearly blew my mind. I was raised on beans and cornbread. Like this, I had never dined." There was bread and fruit, three kinds of meat. This was a dream. Also five kinds of vegetables, topped off with cake and ice cream. Man, I was in hog heaven, and I walloped three times a day. Besides the chow came free clothes, plus 21 bucks monthly pay. I couldn't believe some guys who griped about the grub. As I said, many were poor, like me. Who you kidding, bub? Aside from those amenities, we drilled and pulled KP. KP stands for kitchen police, no arrests. Just drudgery. So uh, going into the Army, you, you ate a lot better, and you dressed a lot better, and you got some money for it. Yeah. Hey, I was in the hog heavens, I said. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I thought, well, they gave us this show to get us in, and then after that, it's going to be out. Man, it was that way all the time. I was <laughs> happy. But you were at Elmendorf Field. Is, is, that's where you were, you were first sent, and that's uh, for people who don't know their geography. That's just near, I guess, just north of Anchorage, right? Very, very near Anchorage. Uh, it's where right out, is, right outside. outskirts, you'd say. That's, uh, of yeah. Anchorage. Talk about what you did. You were a radio operator, not talking, but tapping out. You were a tapper. Right. Uh, dots and day, dot on, that sort of stuff. Right. So, uh, we, uh, of course, in the, the radio, you learned regular alphabet, U.S., Dots and dash, da 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 da, was Q. But we got up there and we found out that, hey, they had a different alphabet. Mm -hmm. What the hell is this? It's all in two extra numbers, two extra uh, letters. Turned out we were learning to communicate with the Russian. Right. So uh, in a few months, they got me on a plane with uh, Master Sergeant. We went to Nome, Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> now and you talk about Nome, Alaska. You talk about <clears throat> where is a place? Nome, Alaska. That's it's right on the Bering Sea. Right, it's the far and western part of the state. As right. I 
excuse this, but uh, my saying, you're, the rest of Alaska is lush. You see it all the time. Uh -huh. At Nome, barren, nothing. No tree. I mean, none, no tree, period. Right. And if I, as I told people, if Alaska ever got sick, where they would give the enema would be at Nome, Alaska. <laughs> I, I've heard you say that. And I'm, I'm sure the I'm sure the Chamber of Commerce of Nome probably doesn't uh, put that on their sign. But Chamber uh, of Commerce, <laughs> they're lucky to have a, a sheriff. This would be a good time to jump ahead a little bit and talk about the weather. Not only the weather, but the the, the northern lights. Okay. The uh, during the during the winter time, it's light for only about three hours a day. During the summertime, it doesn't turn dark at all. Right. Sort of how that affected you and how you, how a, you know a kid from Oklahoma got used to that. First of all, at Nome, three months of the year in the summertime, the harbor was open. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's frozen solid. So any supplies you had for eating or you know, food and such came in by boat those three months. Well, along about January, we were run out of meat, so they'd get on the half track and go out in the wilderness and shoot a reindeer and drag it in. So that was our meat for the rest of the year. Right. Um, surprisingly, when I first moved up there, we were in tents. And eventually they got the uh, Quonset huts, which are the metal half circle deals. Right. And uh, quite comfortable, really. And then Northern Lights, Well, I think once in a while, I actually saw them in Oklahoma one time, mm -hmm. but it was just a display of violets, blues, greens, like uh, gases, just moons all over the, pretty, but boy, for radio signals. It would. They killed it. It killed your radio signal. Yeah. It would bounce your signals or, to who, well, who knows where. Well, statics. So. Right. Oh, yeah. Right, right. That's Make why it. I can hardly hear. That's why I have two hearing aids today. Right, right. Because yeah. of the noise it was created yeah. from saving the signals yeah. bouncing right. off the northern lights. And trying you, to hear the signal through that. You talked about the time and, and the, where the sun would the sun would not go down or, or the sun would not come up well, depending on the time of year. Well, and especially during the summertime, you had to sleep according to the clock, not according to whether it got dark because it didn't get dark and sometimes that was right. difficult. Well, space had moved on from there, moved to Fairbanks. Right. And it's uh, 40, 50 miles below the Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. And which meant it didn't completely get dark. But in the so called summertime, the sun had come up about three hours mm -hmm. dark. And uh, of course, they, uh, and, and I mean, in the winter time it was that way, and in the summer it was just the opposite. Fairbanks Chamber of Commerce, and they did have that Chamber of Commerce. Right. Had a baseball game, and they threw out the first pitch at midnight. Thing is, no spotlights or floodlights. It's sunshine. That was one of their big deals. Right. Baseball at midnight. Right. Right. Sometimes you had to try to sleep while other people well, were playing cards or messing around, right? Well, we were on, <laughs> we were eight on, sixteen off, so. Right. Right. Well, I want you to talk about your job and what you did when you were in Nome, uh, <coughs> Alaska, and and about the the ferrying of airplanes and sort of uh, and the Russian pilots and sort of how you you become a little little bit versed with the uh, American Russian relations in, in World War II. You got to know a couple of them anyway. Right. Yep. The, of course, what they did was they set up the uh, Lend Lease program. Mm -hmm. We gave them planes and they gave us hell. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the uh, U.S. pilots would fly the planes to Fairbanks and then the Russians take over. And they had a pretty neat system. They had the B 25, which is a radio contract contact with the Earth. And then behind it, they'd string back these pursuit planes, and they had contact with the mothership, which talked down below. Well, mm -hmm. 
those planes that they loved were the P-39s. They had a cannon in the nose, and they loved to shoot those Krauts, All right. Kraut tanks with those things. Mm -hmm. So our job was really basically is contact the Siberian station, get the weather report, tell them the planes are coming, and back and forth that way. Right. And of course, the pilot had no, <coughs> excuse me, the weather over there, and we'd get the weather report from Siberia. And that's about it. Give them a flight plan, how many planes are coming, and boy, we sent a lot of them over there. Indeed. They like the P-39s. They, yeah, uh, oh, they love right, the P-39s. Right. Yeah. And they would use them to fight the Germans on the Well, on the Western yes, front. strafing for the tanks, the, mm -hmm. those cannons, they love that. So we had a couple of Russian, this old uh, Sergeant Musienko, he was, he, if you were visualizing a Russian peasant, you'd think of this guy. He's big and burly and kind of pretty nice looking, really. And they had this cocky little Zorno with the lieutenant. Mm -hmm. and he had a little gun he wore that he'd taken off. Of, he was on the Western Front. He'd taken off a German, um, I guess, a dead person. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they couldn't speak English. We couldn't speak German. I mean Russian. So we communicated each other with our radio signals right. by writing. <clears throat> and even there, you didn't use letters because Q's and R's, they had their own alphabet. Right. So we just spelled dot, dash, dot. Like, like QRM was, I have a message for you. So we'd put QRT, which is time, and then a question mark. Wonder when they, that would ask them, when are you going to come back to the station? Mm -hmm. Of course, communicating with the... Uh, Russian station on the other side, that's all we used, that kind of language. And we found out those lady over, the people over there, the operators were women. Right. So we'd flirt with them. 77 in Russian, <laughs> uh, not Russian, in the uh, ham language. Uh -huh. 77, 88 for love and kisses. So we're going to send them kisses. <laughs> that leads me to some more poetry, as a matter of fact. I'll read this now because you talk about this in your writing says a, a radio station was to be built to send signals across the Bering Sea. Then would follow a sky full of Lindley's planes. Really, Lindley's meant free. When the station went on the air, I fingered the sending key. I sent the Siberian station call letters across the Bering Sea. I kept tapping those call letters till I achieved victory. Radio communication were now in place across the icy sea. And then you went on to say, like you just referred to, all the Russian operators were female, maybe grandmas or misses. I tapped out 73s and 88s, telegraphies for love and kisses. Yeah. <clears throat> so you were flirting with that radio tap key, right? <laughs> this Musienko was a character. He'd try to tell us jokes in Russian. Of course, we didn't understand. It was like, one time he went into Nome, and he came back, and he's all excited. He says... He tried, of course, he couldn't tell us what he'd say. And he showed us, he said, like, mm -hmm. and then he started turning around, just humming mm -hmm. right away. Hey, he'd seen his first jukebox. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he thought that's the greatest. This old peasant, really, he was a peasant, is what he was. Right. He was really excited about the jukebox. He'd seen a lot of gnome, his first one ever. Right, right. You were in Nome for, uh, I guess, oh, almost two years, right? Uh, or in Alaska for, for so almost three years. Yeah. And uh, you kind of thought they'd thrown away your records and forgotten about you, right? <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, yes. No furloughs, no. <laughs> Middle of 1943, you were transferred to Fairbanks, and then you came home in April of 1944 and went uh, served in Arizona and California at the time. Uh, did a lot of flight plans, uh, numbers, right. call letters. Right. Just kept on being a radio guy. Um, but then you, when you came back to the United States, they kind of gave you the option to, like, where do you want to go? Well, you told them where you wanted to go, but you didn't get to go there, right? Well, first of all, when I left Fairbanks, the snow was up here. They sent me to Phoenix, Arizona. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's a difference. My Lord, for <laughs> the first
first month, I was smoking around. My blood thinned out. I was okay. <laughs> uh, you thought yeah, out. as far as the, they said, hey, you've been over months. You get your choice. I said, okay, Paris, B9, Big Ben, all that stuff. I'll take Europe. Okay, about a couple of months, you're assigned to the Philippines. <laughs> right, right. I wanted to backtrack because one thing that we missed was the fact that when you were in Alaska, is you were in Alaska on December 7, 1941. Yes. And uh, what do you recall about that Sunday? Well, there it was lunchtime. Mm -hmm. I just come out of the mess hall, and this guy came running across the way and said, Hey, Pearl Harbor's been attacked. Yeah, where's Pearl Harbor? You know, <laughs> like most people probably didn't know where it was. So, uh, I don't know why, but before the day was over, they had me out on this little dirt road with a Thompson submachine gun, which I fired once in recruit camp. Mm -hmm. I was, I was def <laughs> defending that Elmsdorf field. Man, talk about silliness. I don't know. It shows really how, how unprepared the U.S. was. Right. Really. Right. In all lots of regards. That's right. So that was yeah. the difference between you were not in war and you were in war. Yeah, they gave you right. a gun and said, go defend something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then you, uh, but things ratcheted up then. I mean, when America was in the oh. war, things, oh, things yeah. changed. You saw things that you hadn't seen before. Right. 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 More airplanes coming. A few months after that, I'm up in Nome and, man, mm -hmm. we got planes going to Russia, but every other day practically right right when you came back to the states you'd ask for europe so like the service normally does they sent you to the philippines right, right. <laughs> about as far away from europe as you could get right and long, it was a long boat ride because you uh, they avoided the a lot of the activity so we made a big circle and went around new guinea and then came up to the philippines mm -hmm. I think it was about three weeks on that darn boat. Right. Of course, we were stacked about five high in the bunks on the uh, on the ship. But it was before the war. SS Aurora Lines, one of the cruise lines you paid a lot of money to ride on. Well, mm -hmm. for us, it wasn't that big a deal. Right. By the time you got to the Philippines, though, most of the operations there were over. The war was wrapping up. Yeah. Uh, the bomb had not been dropped yet, though. No, you were no, in no. the Philippines when the bomb was dropped in 1945. Yeah. Right. And all the rumors, hey, we're going to be inundated by, in, in by tidal waves and the world's coming to the end and all that. It's, of course, none of it happened. What right. did, it's got us home. That's right. What. But there was also, uh, obviously, the, the rumors that, that everybody was dealing with, that there was going to be a ground war. In, oh, in, oh, in, yeah. in Japan. Oh, yeah, sure. And, uh, and of course, the bomb dropped, and that changed all that, Amen. and the war ended. And, Amen. And, <laughs> and, you were, uh, and then you were able to, uh, to come home. And, you, and uh, a fascinating career after your service. Um, you, uh, you, you came home, and uh, I believe you uh, were uh, discharged in uh, October of 1945. Right. Is that right? Right. And you went to Colorado because that's where your sister lived. Right. That's where you started out. Right. And you started off in college there, but then talk about after that. Well, first of all, I, after five years away from school, right out of high school, I didn't know if I could cut college or not. So my sister said, could come live with us and see if you'd like it and could cut it. I could. I wanted journalism, which is the best journalism school, or at least the most popular anyway, no, mm -hmm. was Missouri University, so I signed up. You went to Columbia. Went to Columbia, and uh, if you're out of state, you weren't entitled to housing there because you had there's such a shortage. They asked for the local natives to get the first, well, the only way I could get in was to join a fraternity, and boy, you talk about going around and Sweet talking of <laughs> to, to get pledged, and yeah, I made it. To so. get a place to live. Right. 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 <laughs> so you were a frat boy. 
Uh, yeah. well, you don't look the part right yeah. now, but, uh, but you were a frat boy. Huh? I, from necessity. <laughs> of course, you, I enjoyed it. Because you needed a bed, right? But you majored in journalism at Missouri, which is still known as one of the foremost uh, journalism schools right. in the United right. States. There's no doubt about right. that. Right. And that sent you to corporate journalism, as it were, because right. you went to work for uh, Standard Oil Cup, uh, right. Company. And uh, talk about what you, what you did. You, you traveled around place to place, sort well, of writing for their, their, their newsletter or their house organ, right? Right. First of all, that was the idea was I, I supplied for several places for jobs. To be a magazine, I didn't want to get newspapers. Mm -hmm. It's what I wanted to write. Wanted to last more than one day. <laughs> right. So I connect with them, and they had a nice publication, magazine, monthly, and uh, this enabled me to travel all over the Midwest, eleven states. Tulsa, Chicago, right. Texas right. City, Kansas City, mm -hmm. Houston, yeah. right? <clears throat> all from Wyoming to right. Indiana, to south to Texas. Yeah. Right. That whole area. And, and talk about what you'd write about. You would write feature stories about not only employees of Standard Oil Company, but employees of sort of a sub subsidiary well, or supplier or people that, had that you supplied, right? If it had a connection with the company, mm -hmm. like for instance, that <clears throat> I did a story about uh, automaking. Well, that's because our company supplied any number of greases and lubricants for all their for their uh, machines that made the automobiles. Right. Or it might be uh, uh, a story about grape nuts. Yeah, you well, went to Battle Creek to write yeah. about the people who make grape nuts, right? There, up in Missouri, in uh, well, Colorado, mm -hmm. did molybdenum, molybdenum right. <laughs> mining because we supplied the materials for sure. they did for the mining. So. Yeah, I could just pick and choose, and man, it was fun. Was of course, I had to always tie in the employees. They were either working for the that outfit, or they were supplying mm -hmm. the materials or some way. So. There's one thing I wanted to backtrack to that I didn't want to miss. Back in your service in Alaska, you had spent a lot of time writing sort of a autobiography, sort of a memoir in Alaska, and tell them about what happened to that. You don't know what well, happened to it, but no. To, yeah. Well, I said no, and we either were working or we're sitting in the Quonset hut because there's no recreation. You know, on some army base you had gyms and all that stuff, but Nome was just didn't have all that. Right. So I had a typewriter, and I decided to write a memoir about my growing up, and Grandpa and Grandma on the farm, and. I wrote it and sent it in, and I don't know what, it's probably some warehouse someplace. I don't know. I don't have any idea. <laughs> yeah, but I like, never was published, but it gave me good experience writing. So. Yeah, well, like I said, you, you sent it through, uh, you sent it through the, uh, the censors. Well, the censorship, yeah. Yeah, there was, it was, there was a matter of fact, there was uh, something in this book that, uh, that I was going to read if I could uh, if I could find it. I talked about how you wrote poetry. Let me read this one real quick. I, just, I love your writing. I, well, it's, thank it's, you. It's tremendous. Uh, you evidently enjoyed golf. This has nothing to do with his service or anything else. But and and the poetry says a uh, a bogey is one over par. An eagle is minus two. A birdie is one under par. Something I seldom do. Come that time and around when you make those perfect swings, this wipes out all the anguish and gives your ego wings. In golf, a birdie has no feathers, and a bogey has no bacall. When I score a triple bogey, I like to hide and ball. Barry Bonds can smash a ball, traveling an ungodly speed. I can't miss that little sucker sitting quietly on its tee. <laughs> <coughs> uh, that's, that's, that's tremendous of you, right? Talk about uh, uh, 30 years with a Standard Oil Company. Right. Uh, just some great experiences well, there and some great chances to write. The beauty of being with a corporation like that, I worked for the corporation but with several branches of it. So mm -hmm. I'd be a smaller company or be the marketing department or be the sales department or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I had moved from, well, Tulsa, Chicago, Tech City, Kansas City, Chicago, Houston. Right. And every five years, I'd move. 
which was nice. I didn't want to sit behind a desk. You were talking about the censorship. I wish I could read this whole book. I wish we had time. This is uh, an article uh, you wrote called Censors, Scissors, Snip, Substance from Correspondence. It said, Mom kept all the letters I wrote from Alaska long after the war. I dug into them expecting to revive some forgotten experiences. What a pile of pablum. There was nada, zilch, nothing in them. Remember, the war was on and censorship was in effect. You didn't write about the weather, where you were, the surroundings, conditions, your assignment, blah, blah, blah. We were instructed to write on only one side of a sheet, thus the censor could scissor out forbidden information without gutting the letter. And then you say, one time I must have written something really interesting. The envelope contained two strips of paper, Dear Mom on one and my signature on the other, and that was the only thing that was left of the letter. <laughs> so you had to be careful about, uh, about censorship. So right. right. <laughs> um, we have just uh, just a few minutes left. Uh, you and Janet have been married for almost 60 years now. Next Nin February, be 60. 1950. Talk a little bit about your family. Well, I've got four great kids. The, uh, of course, I was the first one in my generation to, come to uh, go to college and get mm -hmm. a degree. And I'm proud to say all four of them got their degrees, and they're doing quite well. Right. And one of them's the local nurse here in College Station, uh, <clears throat> Adele. Another is Adele. Uh, another daughter is Diane up in New York. My uh, <clears throat> youngest works for the the he well he's security around the uh, Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. with the Park Service. Right. And the other one uh, lives in works in Austin. Right. Great David. Uh, Works in Austin, Brian's in New York, or Washington, Diane's in New York. Right. And I know your daughter and your granddaughter help you and Janet out a lot here. You live over at Walden Brook, and right. they, help you, right. they help you a lot. We moved over here in, uh, about 16 months ago. Uh -huh. Chose Walden Brook because of the amenities they have. Right, right. <clears throat> well, I'll tell you what, it, it's, a, it's a remarkable story, and it just goes to show that it's not just the stories of combat that make World War II veterans very interesting people because you had an interesting career. And I want to thank you for your service, but we're out of time. It goes fast. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. He started out thinking that he would be a photographer, but spent 30 years making a career of painting pictures through his written word. And he still enjoys writing whenever he can. Carl and Janet Huss were married in February of 1950. We salute him for his service to our country, as we do all veterans. I'm Tom Turpeville. Join us next time on Veterans of the Valley.